followed by uh, Ms. Johnston. The moderator and timer is designated by the NACP. The moderator has the final authority in all manners uh, of time limits. And with this, we're going to start with Ms. Peronis. 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 Thank you. Good evening, my name is Susanna Baronis, and I would like to begin by thanking the Kinkakee Public Library and the NAACP for hosting this forum tonight. I am a lifelong resident of Kinkakee County, a 1998 graduate of Moments High School. I worked for the Moments School District for 15 years as a bilingual paraprofessional, administrative assistant, club sponsor, as well as a girls basketball coach. In 2016, I graduated from Kankakee Community College with my associate's degree in applied science with a certificate in paralegal studies. I worked as a paralegal for seven years and I am currently employed by the Kankakee Metropolitan River Agency um, as an administrative assistant. When I moved to Kankakee, I knew that I wanted to be part of the district. I wanted to be part of the students' lives. So I reached out to Coach Waite and I asked if I could volunteer as, for his basketball program. He later graciously offered me a position as the head coach for the King Middle School girls basketball program and an assistant coach for the uh, varsity uh, girls team as well. A quick shout out to the girls and the team for their win for the championship this year. Congratulations. Um, I am currently a volunteer mentor for the jump, jump program as well as their event coordinator. The JUMP program is partnered with the Kankakee State's Attorney's Office and we offer mentoring to students who are currently involved in the juvenile court system. After working with the students, I realized that my passion to help students in school, I needed to be part of the school board. Our district right now is currently made up of 31% of Hispanic students. They have no representation on our board. I want to be that voice for the Hispanic students and all of the students of Kankakee. District 111. Our students are growing up to be adult citizens of tomorrow and their development is parallel to our country's future. I believe that I'm suitable for running for our school board and ensuring that all the students of District 111's futures are bright no matter what path they decide to take in life. The school board duties call for a reliable, cooperative, and passionate member, which I consider myself to be. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bowman. I also want to thank the NAACP and the library. The NAACP has performed an incredible service to our community for a long time. And these forums, I believe, are very important for the to have the ability to choose candidates. Tonight, the four of us are here to share our ideas on our school district. The issues sometimes seem complex and overwhelming. However, each of us have ideas and input. We may not agree. That's the strength of a community board. Disagreeing is not a negative. Being disagreeable is, when, and that's when a board will fail. I hope that during this forum we're able to discuss our ideas to improve students' opportunities to succeed. I hope that we can discuss management's successes and honestly discuss management's failures. I would like to discuss with you the retention of licensed teachers and the process of hiring and recruiting additional licensed teachers. I would like to share with you my thoughts on the qualities of a new superintendent that we should pursue. There are many questions that we deal with. As you hear my ideas, my commitment to you as the public is that I will continue, as I have for the last five years, to seek information from the administration by asking questions in open session and in public session. I will continue to do my own research on issues and then share that research based upon what I find. I will continue to consider best practices in management and communication. Finally, I will continue to make independent decisions after all of the considerations have been made. I will continue to work with passion and goals. There's only one motivation for me. My three children graduated from District 111. My wife has taught in District 111. I volunteered in District 111, and I have an education degree. But none of those things matter. What matters to me is, it's the obligation of this school board to assure that each student has the best opportunity possible to succeed. And that's the one and only goal that has motivated me for my term, my term on the board. Thank you. Ms. Johnson. 
Ms. Mrs. Wells. Good evening. My name is Barbara Wells, and I have been on the school board since 2005. And I realized this evening that this is a testament to my life's work. I have always worked in positions that allowed me to help others in need. When I first ran for the school board, I was working for a non-for-profit housing agency, Neighborhood Partners of Kankakee. And in that agency, I helped families obtain home ownership for their first homes, help them clear up their credit, and help them understand what they need to do to become homeowners. And what I found as I did that work is many people were suffering from educational deficits that they had left school with. Some people needed to go and get more training and get better jobs so they could earn higher wages, so they could buy homes. And we look at our city nowadays and we do not retain our residents. Our residents leave because we don't have opportunities for them to take advantage of to stay here. So this is a circular event. Educational outcomes, job opportunities, housing standards for our community. So I have been on the board and I have seen where we have come from. There was a time when our children didn't have the materials that they needed and now we have a candidate running because she's in touch with the district because of programs that have been put in place under my leadership. Ms. Johnston. I have been in this district all of my life. Um, I grew up here. I went through all the schools here. I graduated from Eastridge High School. Um, and when I came back from college, I went into coaching and teaching at the high school. Um, I've done that because of my passion for kids, for athletes, for students. Um, I, have, I have worked with basketball players, softball players, golfers, volleyball players, and I have taught, and I have taught incessantly with these kids. Um, I have developed a lot of, I've developed a lot of uh, relationships with them. I have formed lasting relationships with them, friendships with them, and it's really kind of scary because now they're starting to retire, and I can't understand that at all. But um, as a board member, I just, I've been here for four years, and as soon as I retired, I didn't, I wasn't ready to give up my uh, my my, my uh, uh, thing on the, with the, with the district. I wanted to stay with the district. We have unfinished business. Um, this is probably the most important board that's going to be elected in a long time because our job is to select the new superintendent. Um, we need to be unified in that. We need to make sure that we're showing that we're unified because anytime we do not show unification, um, it shows. People know about it. As I said, I have a strong commitment to this district and I want to continue this, this, this strong commitment. Um, we, need to consider, we need to concentrate on student, student um, growth, student achievement. We need to uh, con concentrate very strongly on teacher retention. We, we retain the teachers, and if we retain the teachers, we can make sure that we have that student achievement. Thank you. Mrs. Clay, you have the question, and the question is to Mr. Bowling. Um, hello, Ms. Bowling. Good evening. What role should the community and parents play in supporting the education of children? Well, I believe strongly that the community and parents are stakeholders. Thank you. <laughs> community and parents are stakeholders in our in our district. 
as if the schools fail, this community will fail also. Their involvement has to be asking questions, getting answers, and then pursuing their involvement with the district. But that's a two-way street because we as a district have not been effective in communicating with the community. We need to have a system. Most, I think, very there's a large group of the community that has no idea what's happening in the schools. So the parents have to be engaged. They have to make sure their children are active, engaged, attending, and doing the homework or their work that they're, that they're assigned. But the community needs to be engaged, but we need to engage both groups also. Thank you. Ms. Johnston. Same question. Yes. One of the things I've noticed that the only time we have parents and even community involved with our board uh, in the board meetings is when there is some sort of uh, controversy. Usually we sit in an auditorium or a gym and there's hardly anybody in the auditorium with us. We're talking to chairs. And I would like to know that the community, especially the parents, they, they need to get involved. They need to come. I've tried to talk to them to tell them to, to you know that you need to come to a meeting. You need you know and well we don't have time. Well, you need to make time. Uh, the lower levels, uh, the uh, <coughs> kindergarten through sixth, the parents are really very prominent in their in their kids' lives. They they go to everything they do. And then we get to the high school and they kind of they, they kind of let the kids well you know the kids don't want to be seen with the parents the parents don't want to be seen with the kids so the kid they don't come so we want to make sure that the parents and the community is involved with everything thank you mrs wells okay i just want to make sure i understood the question what role should the community and parents play in supporting the education of their children. There is a very important role that parents play. Parents are, are a scholar's first teacher. That's been researched and studied. Our district has many programs that help parents educate their children from birth through uh, grade 12. So we perhaps need to do a better job of reaching out to parents, but we also need parents to reach out to us. Tell us what it is that you need so that we can start addressing those needs. We are open to listening and understanding and we need to become more open to that because we cannot expect parents to participate in the way we want them to participate. We need to understand what they need in order to be able to participate. Ms. Baronis. The role of a parent obviously is very important and the parents that want to be involved are already involved. Our district is made up of 85% of low-income students. Working with the students, I realize you have single mothers, single fathers, children being raised by their aunts, their uncles, their grandparents. How do we get those students, those parents engaged with our families, with the, with the school district? There is so many great programs that I have learned that the district does have for parents. But again, those parents are already there. We need to get those parents that you know just don't have the time. What resources can we give them so that they can feel that they are part of the district and they are vital in making decisions for their students? Because a lot of them just don't know, as you know, um, the other candidates have mentioned, communication. We have to be able to communicate with everyone in the district, whether they are a working parent, whether they are a single parent, whether they're being raised by their by their family members. Thank you, Mr. Clark. You have the question and the questions to Ms. Johnston. There has been concerns about the quality of education in uh, the school district here recently. What ideas do you have to help provide a quality education to 
to our future community leaders while ensuring fiduciary responsibility. By ensuring what? Fiduciary, fiduciary responsibility. Um, you're right. We, there's, a, there's a lot of confusion and a lot of uh, problems with, with how what's, what's happening. We need to retain teachers. We need, we need to make sure that we have teachers in place in front of students teaching those students. We still have a handful of kids, and I don't know the number, but it's, it's not, it's more than it should be, that are still staying home and learning in front of the computer. We've given them that opportunity. We need everybody, all those kids need to be in school. Um, a lot of it is mostly at the junior high and high school, but if they're not in school, they're missing out. We also have a horrible attendance rate, and we have, um, we have uh, tutors, or not tutors, but uh, people that are they're going out and they're trying to get these kids back to school, um, and it's, and, but it's, a, it's an uphill battle. We, we, we've allowed those kids to stay home, and they've taken advantage of it, and we need to stop that now. They need to be in class. Mrs. Wills. So your question was about the quality of education. One of the things that we've done is we've asked our teachers to give our students grade level assignments. One of the ways a school district is judged is based on the standardized testing at the end of the year. You cannot take a grade level standardized test if all year long you've been uh, exposed to work that is below grade level. So that's one problem. And I agree with uh, Ms. Johnson that we do need students to come to school. But do we realize that students need five people in their lives that talk to them about their life? So if you see a student anywhere, at the grocery store, at the McDonald's, just walking down the street, ask them how their day was. Ask them what they learned today. Ask them did they go to school today. Because they need to know that we care. And until they know we care, they don't want to know anything that we have for them. Ms. Baronis. Quality of education, I, I need to research more on where the disconnect happened. I've been doing a lot of research, been using the Illinois, uh, the ISBE website, using the Illinois report card. So I, like Ms. Johnson and Ms. Wells, the truancy rate is just out through the roof. And so it makes me concerned as to why are these students not coming to school? So I went back and I looked at the test scores, as Ms. Wells said, that you know, that's how we're that's how the grade, that's how the school is, you know, looked at. In 2019, 27.7 of our students did not meet their at their grade level. In 2022, 42.7 of our district's students did not meet. What happened from 2019 to 2022 besides COVID? What happened in our district to where our test scores and our students are not meeting at grade level? So for me, it's more of a, I need to find out and I would like to talk to people to figure it out. Mr. Bowman. There are things that we can't do to improve student achievement. When they announced that we were giving COVID funds, I, I proposed and suggested that we hire tutors because the one thing, and we're here, I literally, I heard it on the radio today. The one thing that has proven effective in substantially raising student achievement is one-on-one -on -one tutoring. It doesn't have to be a professional educator. It can be a high school student tutoring an elementary student. But the one-on-one -on -one and the accountability between the student and the tutor is critical. Number two, this is a simple one, and it's one that has bugged me for three years, is we don't have a high school library. We don't have a high school librarian because why I don't know. We have a circulation of books last year in the high school library of 128 books. Meanwhile, Kennedy had 15,600 books circulated. 
how do you improve, improve student achievement? One of the bases of research says you have a qualified librarian working with the kids. Thank you. Dr. LeConte, you have the next question, and it's to uh, Mrs. Wells. Thank you. I don't know if this microphone is on. I think you can hear me now. Thank you so much. I will sit back a little. So, don't raise your card, I'll be Paula, because I. That's <laughs> <laughs> disturbing to me. <laughs> Mr. Bowman, I know I'm addressing Ms. Wells. I absolutely agree with you. So, the question that I was about to ask, I will postpone until later. I'm sitting here and I'm just floored that there is no high school library. Unbelievable. I'll be honest with you. Unbelievable. 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 Dr. LeConte, question to I'm about Mrs. To do, Wells. I, I'm about to go there. Mrs. Wells, why isn't there a library for the students? That just doesn't sit well with me as an educator for more than 43 years. I've always had libraries in my schools. Well, during the construction of the high school, Whoever was in charge of the library books, they got disposed of instead of retained. That was one of the problems. Now, who was responsible? We have not investigated that. The, the superintendent at this time believes that the library should be in the learning hubs. We have restructured the high school, so we have a freshman hub, we have a STEM hub, we have a medical academy hub, and we have, um, I think, a science hub. So the books that go with those categories should be in those areas. And the process is not complete of restocking those books, but that is the plan. So going back to having a physical library, Every book that is published is actually available on the internet. And we have made um, apps available to our students to access those books. Am I able to respond or you just go to the next person? No. No, no Dr. McCann. Uh, Ms. Barone, you. you have the next question. Thank you. Good question. Ms. Thank you, Ms. I am in a position to where I don't know the answer to that question. I, that is something that I would have to talk to, you know, some faculty members, other board members. But I guess my concern is, as a board, why are we not following up with what has been changed? If we make the decision as a board, it is our responsibility to follow up to make sure that the policies that we are enforcing are being followed. And if there is a problem with the policy, then it needs to be brought to us so we as a board can discuss it and review it. It's all about communication. That's what we need to have, communication amongst everyone who is involved in this district. Thank you. Mr. Bowman. I honestly don't know. I, I really don't know because I, when we started, when I started looking at this, I presented to my fellow board members and to the administration notebooks with about 350 pages of articles talking about how a certified librarian increases student achievement. Sometimes in some schools, that's the one direct correlation they can find. Uh, the board decided not to, not, I made a motion to post, just post the position. The board made it. Mr. Bowman, can you pull the mic in toward you, please? Getting feedback from. Yes. Uh, in terms of uh, that research, the board decided a three to three vote not to post the position for a certified librarian. That was a year and a half ago. We still have not posted a position for a certified librarian. So, am I frustrated over this issue? Darn two. And it's something that I still have got to raise as many times as I raise it, and the board gets tired of me raising it, but it's critical. Thank you. 
Ms. Jones? I happened to be there when they were purging the books from the library. They cart after cart, and I was in the li I was in the cafeteria. Cart after cart went past me, and with all these books, I'm where are you going? We're throwing them away, put them in the dumpster, and I'm like, what? And this was when we were getting ready for the renovation. We were getting rid of all the books from the library, and I, some of the teachers actually saved them, but they didn't save them quick enough. There was still thousands of books left. And I, I was appalled, and I also can't understand why there is no library. The hubs have probably 100 or 200 books in each of them. Uh, there is a learning center, a student success center, that has one wall of anime books and another wall of uh, fiction books. Uh, there's probably 750 books in there. We had thousands of books in the library, and I don't care how much internet you have to be able to call up a book on, you still have to pay for it. I don't care how many apps, you don't just go to Amazon and say, I have an app, I want a book. They're not gonna give you that, you have to pay for it. And the fact that we don't have access to that is just amazing, that actual library. Ms. Markham, you have the question, the question is true, Ms. Brooks. Um, the, the board recently approved a reduction in graduation requirements for the Kankakee High School class of 2023 due in part to errors in students' transcripts and last year's scheduling problems. Um, what should be done to ensure these reductions aren't needed or used again in the future? I'm fairly new to the CBE learning, so I've done a little bit, I've done some research and I've attended the board meetings. Um, to my, to me, I believe we have to make sure we have the proper assessments available to test the competency. We can't just accordingly change what we believe they're competent in. We have to have them show us and prove to us they are competent. Because if we don't, those students are moving on and they're going to be set up for failure. Assessments. That's what I was told when I asked about how we prove competency. They said that there is an assessment. Then we need to make sure those assessments are done and they're not just written in. I don't know if that's happened. So I need, I need to get more information about what's happened before, but moving forward, make sure the assessments are done. Make sure that we're utilizing CBE the way it is supposed to be utilized, and it would be great for our district. Our kids would thrive if we use it correctly. Mr. Bowman. Well, I, I, was very public. I was very public in my position on this, and that is, our district doesn't need to reduce graduation requirements. We need to provide kids with sufficient education to, to achieve our graduation requirements. And there is way, yes, there were mistakes made by the, by the management of the district, which included the scheduling issue, which included apparently not enough accountability to make sure that teachers were giving grades, but also on the other side, not making sure that students were attending and students were achieving. So how do we make sure it doesn't happen in the future? Well, we start managing the district like it needs to be managed, which is you would make sure teachers are doing what they're supposed to be doing. You make sure students are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And you make sure administration doesn't lose a schedule for nine weeks of the, of the year. Uh, going forward, you know, I think now I know some questions, and I think the rest of the board members know that we need to ask questions and not just trust that it's all going well. Ms. Johnson. I, I totally agree with all of that. Um, I was appalled when I was told that we are going to waive classes. We're going to get rid of um, electives. They're not going to count. We've taken grades, and I, if you know anything about CB or how the grading system went, there are DNMs, that means does not meet. And those DNMs were changed to Ds because the State Board of Education didn't understand what a DNM was. 
so we just, they just gave us a D. Well, then when those came back, there wasn't enough, there still wasn't enough grade, grades, positive grades to get 187 kids to be able to graduate. So we started changing grades. We started eliminating classes. We started, we started um, turning our heads to what was going on. And we and were allowing these kids that don't have the qualifications to have an actual uh, high school degree to walk the stage and say that we, we, have, a, we have a degree. Um, there, there have been places and times where you've had, where you've had kids not hit the qualifications to graduate, so they go to summer school to make up those qualifications. They don't just get to graduate and, and just move on with their life. They actually have to get the grades and get the, get the uh, actual classes needed, and we need to do that. And in answer to really your question was, I'm scared that it's gonna happen again, because COVID didn't just affect the class of 2023. In fact, it affected probably the, the incoming seniors Thank for next year, and I'm afraid of that. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Mrs. Wells, uh, in your answer to that particular question, you have uh, 11 extra seconds uh, to respond. I have what? You have extra time to respond. This district has been in crisis, actually, since before COVID. And to sit here and pretend that we never graduated students with lacking credentials before this year is disingenuous. We've had students who struggled to the graduation line with Ds. It has happened, it happens across the country. You can graduate high school with a D. I have talked to uh, a number of people. One person is a judge, sits on the uh, circuit court bench here in Northern Illinois, planning on running for the uh, Supreme Court of Illinois. He told me in a private conversation that he was a D student in high school. He is now a judge. Just because a student does not meet when we want them to meet, when we put the measurement out there, that does not mean that that student will end up a failure, number one. Number two, the students didn't fail, the adults did. So now we're going to punish students because adults didn't do what they're supposed to do. We have a truancy problem. We only, I don't know what I want to say to, to bring this all together, but I, I just want you to understand that this problem is not new. Children not reading, not new. We as a community cannot hand this over to teachers and administrators and say, here's the kids, teach them. We all need to get in behind and come alongside and let these children understand that we truly believe education is important. People spend a lot of time knocking District 111 and they blow up any failure that they find. And then any success that we have, oh, we can sit that to the side. That's not really all that great. But look at that failure. And this is not true. And our children are absorbing this. They're absorbing this. They're absorbing those Facebook po posts, the, the things that people say about our school district. They hear it, and they have to live through it. We really need to change our mindsets. This is not the century in which we graduated high school. This is a new age and a new time, and we need to like our village was there for us, we need to now be there for our children. And when you see a child walking the street and you know school is in session, it's incumbent upon you to say to that child, aren't you supposed to be in school? What grade are you in? It's okay to ask them questions. 
It's okay. We need to get back to that. Because we cannot expect, no matter how much we pay somebody, to take 150 minds, because that's usually the roster a high school teacher has, about 150 students, to take those minds and guide them and mold them, and no one else has hands on them but that teacher. And no one else has hands on the other 1,300 but that school administrator. It takes all of our hands. And we have to begin to lift those children and begin to help them understand that this is important. To talk about the fact that we altered course, you cannot, okay, what happens to those students if you don't graduate them? That's the question you need to ask. So, and what happens to those students if they don't come back to school? How many years will it be? between Ms. us failing Ms. them Wells. at this point and them recovering Ms. in Wells. the future. Thank you. So we, we went through one series of questions with everyone and we talked about communication, parental support, attendance, uh, issues with the library. So starting with you, Mr. Boland, with those four issues, as a board, um, the library, board decision, communication, parental support, that's administration, attendance, administration. So with those four concerns, how can we adhere to improve those particular four items? We can, we can start by saying, because somebody suggests something that's different, we don't automatically get defensive and reject it. And that's happened during my five years, not just to me, and it's happened to others, and not just to the board. There are community members who have made suggestions about things. And instead of dialoguing and saying, is that something that's gotta work, we get defensive as a board and as an administration and put up walls so we can't do the dialogue necessary to find new ideas and new ways to do things. Ms. Jones. We are, we get very defensive. We, and, it, and it's obvious, um, we, we make a suggestion and it is shot down, it is dismissed. Um, the fact that we have it, uh, the lack of a library, uh, truancy problems, uh, parental support, um, what was the fourth one you said? Communication, Communication. parental support, attendance, and the issue regarding who makes that decision regarding not having a library. I, I wish I knew that too. Um, I, I don't know. I thought that, I'm thinking really they thought that uh, um, technology would take care of that, but it really doesn't. Um, a kid has a, a phone or, a, or an iPad or, a, or a, a whatever in, a, in, in front of them. They might do a little bit of reading, of it, but you know it's going to turn back to you know, communication with their friends more than reading. Um, we we need we need to be able to make suggestions on the board, knowing that it's going to be talked about, discussed, and not shut down immediately without even without even question. Um, I had we, we had one person say that that when we went one of the library, it was like, well, why do we have a library? The kids don't read anyway. Yes, they do. And they will read if they have access to a library. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Mrs. Wells. Okay, so let's start with communication. Communication is a two-way event. It's not just what is said to you, but it's what you understand about what is said to you. So one of the things that I've been asking the district to do is to over communicate. I don't know how my other board members feel, but sometimes I feel like being on the school board is a bit like riding on a runaway train because it's one event after another. So it's not just going to uh, flow easily. Um, parental support. I have a question 
for you all. I have a parent in my household. She works 10 hour days. She starts work at 9.30. She does not get off till eight o'clock. School is in session uh, for her children from 7.30 until 3.30. At what time should she engage with the school without having to take time off work? And that is a question that a lot of our parents face. I'm sorry, I can't address the other two. Ms. Okay. Barones. So I am muted the district and I started attending some board members and Ms. Wells made the comment about how our students are affected by Facebook posts, by things that they see. And when they don't see a board that is unified and that can work together, that is not a good sign of leadership as a board. And I feel that if you can't be a good board and show good leadership and show that you are open to suggestions, open to comments, respectful to one another we have failed as a board that is where it's going to start you have to learn to work together to communicate and to be respectful of one another the other problems would be fixed if not fixed but we can move forward in those areas if we can learn to communicate as a board then the administration would learn how would be feel more comfortable to communicate with us as well and that would trickle down throughout the district. Thank you, Mrs. Clegg. If you have the next question, and it's to Ms. Johnston. Um, with the board being in crisis for so long, um, how could long-standing um, board members continue to allow the um, displacement of students, the academic failures to continue, um, especially being at the elementary schools? and the junior high are both in the bottom five percent in the state and the high school is in the bottom ten percent of the state at what point does the board hold administration accountable i believe we have tried to um it's uh, and it's a, and it's a trickle down effect i mean it it starts at the top it starts at central office and then it moves into the buildings and then it moves to the teachers, and then it moves to the students. At one time, at, at what time do we take the total uh, thing away from the students? It's, like, it's almost like the students are not being held accountable. It's always it's the teachers. The teachers have failed. The teachers don't. The teachers don't teach to, to grade level. One of the problems is social social promotion. I mean, how do you teach? a kid at grade level when they read at second grade level and they're a junior in high school. It's hard to do that. And I know there's there are programs that you need to, to put these kids in so they are able to they are able to understand what's going on. But social promoting the kids, keeping them going, we're setting them up for failure. And we're putting the teachers are having trouble because they have to adapt what they're doing in order to accommodate the kids that are, that are having trouble learning. Thank you, Mrs. Wills. Would you repeat your question again? I didn't capture all of that. With the district ran in crisis for so long, how, how long does long-standing members continue to allow to watch students fail academically, being that the elementary and junior high schools are in the bottom 5% in the state, in the junior high, the high school is in the bottom ten percent of the state. At okay. what point do you hold administration accountable? Okay. Um, so I'm going to start with our performance on standardized tests. Do we know when standardized tests became commonplace in education? It was after desegregation. Standardized tests have been shown to be racially biased. They are just now becoming unbiased. Again, I spoke earlier to the fact that you cannot expect a child to pass a standardized test if they've been see receiving less than grade level work. And the question 
that we all should be asking ourselves is how does a student make it from grammar school to a junior in high school reading at a second grade level? And I've been a living witness in my family to that happening to students that were not in my direct family, but were related to me. And one of the things that helps that child is when people in their life take an interest in them. Again, that is taking that life of that child and handing it over to the administration of the school, to the teacher in the classroom, and telling them, here, you teach them. It is a community process. Just one other thing, I'm sorry. In my life, I grew up in a family. My father had a third grade education. My mother left, high, left junior high school because her mother had passed away. And both of those people never spoke about us graduating high school. But it was an expectation in our household. We need to, as a community, go back to having those kinds of expectations. Putting the expectation on a stranger to make sure that your child learns how to read is, I don't want to say ludicrous, but it, do, it does not work the way we want it to. When I was taught- Thank you, Ms. Ms. Wells. Ms. Uh, Ms. Johnson, you have uh, uh, some additional time to go back uh, regarding uh, your, your answer, and then there was Ms. Uh, Barona's, uh, along with Mr. Bowen, too, when you get to the question. If you want to add anything, that's what I'm saying. Actually, I, do, I agree that the parents need to take um, ownership. Um, when the kids are, especially the younger kids, K through six, K, K through six, reading with them at home is so important. Um, I, very quickly, I, I had a basketball player that could read. She was a DCFS kid. She should have been the poster child for DCFS. But she could read, and because she could read, she excelled on the ACT test, and because of that, she ended up with a full ride scholarship to Villanova. If she was not able to read, and that she couldn't do almost, almost anything else, she was marginal with all of her other classes, but she could read. And she took that, that college education, and she's now a six-figure six -figure, uh, worker for, um, I believe, uh, one of the insurance companies out east. If she couldn't have read, that, that wouldn't have happened. And I'm so proud of that, that person that did that. And that, that's what we, the kids need to read. But if there's no books to read, how do you read? So. Okay, thank you. Um, as a timer and uh, as the moderator, I'm going to expand uh, each question for at least another 15 seconds. Um, make sure that everyone get a, a fair opportunity to get their points over. Ms. Baronis, do you have the question? So let me clarify, Was it, there are two questions in there. Do you want to know when you, the board should be held responsible and then later when the administration, or are you just asking about administration in general? Yes, when when does the board hold administration? Okay, um, again, upon researching on the ISB report card, that's all I really had available to me, I did see a huge decrease um, in a lot of our, a lot of our numbers. And that is really, really concerning to me. So as a board, I think we need to follow up with our administration. I mean, two years, three years, I mean, are we gonna go on for four years? I think it needs to be something that is addressed right away so that we're not put in a situation where we were just put in this past year. We need to continue to keep following up with the administration and holding everyone accountable, as we should be held accountable for decisions that we make as well. So if we're not looking at our numbers and asking questions as to why, why are our numbers failing? Our, do our teachers, we always want to blame the teachers. Why? Because they're the ones in the forefront, but they're the ones that are the less protect, least protected. Why? Do our teachers not have the tools that they need or the resources or the help from administration to help our students succeed, to help our students move forward? Those are the questions that we as a board need to be asking to figure out what needs to be fixed. 
to sit back and say, it's okay to graduate with a D. Okay, I understand that. And just because I know a student graduates with a D, I don't see them as a failure. Absolutely not. But my job would be, to, or as, as an educator, to make sure, okay, he's a D student. What other options does he have? What trade can he go to? Can he utilize KCC so that he can become a, a, a good student? Myself, when I graduated high school, I failed out of KCC. I wasn't the best high school student. At the age of 31, I went back to school when it was more important to me and I knew that, that what I wanted to do in life, and I graduated with honors. Why? Because at the time, it was time for me, and not every student, when they're in high school, they don't know life. Again, you. our students- Thank you, Ms. Barones. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Bowen. Ms. Wells and I agree on the concept of teaching at grade level. I think that's a critical concept. And our district has worked hard to evaluate, train, and reevaluate teachers and their grade level and their uh, lesson plans to assure they're teaching at grade level. But when you spend all of the time we've spent and money to get teachers to teach at grade level, then we turn around and lower standards. And there's something intrinsically wrong with that. And I, I've heard board members say, well, you're punishing students for adult mistakes. Are we not punishing students when we send them out into the real world without having the adequate education that we promised their parents we would give them? That's the punishment. It's not just saying, here's a diploma, go on and have a good time. <coughs> Our job is to educate. We are the Board of Education, and if you reduce standards in order to walk them off the stage, we haven't accomplished what we set out to do. Now, there are tons of good things happening in classrooms in our district, tons. You can find successful students, you can find, you know, I've said recently, we do extracurricular activities really, really well. If we could capture that and do academics so well, we wouldn't have any, we wouldn't be sitting up here complaining. So that's the that's format we've gotta do. We've gotta look at the success in one area of the school see if we can transfer that into academics. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Do you have a question? Questions to Mrs. Wells. Mr. Bowen, you brought up extracurriculars and that's where my next question is going to go. There's currently a district policy that requires any athlete to pay $40 to be a part of the athletic team. There are certain teams that do not follow that guideline until the end of the school year. What can be done to make sure that they are following that guideline and that policy immediately as it was written? Okay. Please repeat that. I'm sorry. There are, there's a $40 charge and some children are not paying it? There are, there are teams, specific teams and athletes that do not pay the, the $40 before the season starts like they are required to and wait until the end of the school year or until they graduate to pay. So what would be done to make sure that that policy is being followed? Okay. I don't know if what you're telling me is true. I've never heard anything about that. But again, is the $40 going to break the district? I don't think so. But will the $40 break the heart of a child and deny them an opportunity? Probably, if we enforce the policy, it is written. If it's not enforced, you know, I again would have to ask the superintendent, who would then have to ask the athletic director, who would then have to tell us why he made the decision not to enforce it. We have, at this time, adequate resources to support our students in their endeavors. And I don't think that that's a misuse of district funds at all, if a family cannot afford $40 to have their child pay on a play on a team to succeed at something that they can then scaffold into success for their life. 
Thank you, Ms. Baronis. Um, as a coach, I'm familiar with the athletic feat, and Momex was also made up of a very high, low income. Our policy was, at least for the girls' basketball program, um, as soon as practice started, you had time, and you typically start practice two weeks before. You would need to pay, your athletic fee had to be paid in full before the first game. You weren't kicked off the team, you weren't, you know, you couldn't participate, but you would not be able to play in a game until you paid your $40. I will tell you, the parents that will cry wolf that I can't afford it, trust me you, they came up with the $40. It's about, we, they never lost the opportunity, they were still a part of the team, but it needs to be fair across the board. It's an extracurricular, it's a choice if you want to play the sport. And unfortunately, you're right, maybe not everybody can afford the $40. Maybe we can try interviewing. They're building that activity center. Why don't we use that for inner girls, for those students that can't afford the $50? Thank you, Mr. Bowman. I will be candid. I did not know that there were teams not imposing the $40 fee. It's, this is the first I've heard that, and that's incorrect. Um, the ultimate issue is that we cannot deny a diploma for the basis of owing the school district so if it's being enforced and not collected or not being enforced and not collected, ultimately the question about the diploma is, is a moot point. Uh, insofar as extracurricular activities, uh, it seems to me, and I think I, I tend to agree with Ms. Wells, we, you know, we have free lunch for everybody because we have 85% free and reduced uh, lunch students. I don't have an issue of waiving the fee, period, until such time as we have financial strains that are going to require a reimposition. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. I am very familiar with the $40. Uh, <clears throat> but the integrity uh, as a coach, um, I enforce it with my kids. Um, it's my expectation. My expectation with my teams, whether it was softball, golf, or, or basketball, and by the way, the $40 started out to be a, a $2 fee. You paid the $2 fee, that kind of got you your letter or your shield or whatever it was we gave you at the end of the year. And then it, it blossomed into $40 because now we have so many changeovers of uniforms, a lot of that money is going to the pavement of the uniforms. But my, my, anticip my anticipation with these kids and my expectations with them is they were to pay me the $40, the school district, $40 in my pocket. And I would give it to the athletic office. And my kids did. And then I would find out that other teams, who shall not be named, were not collecting the money. So then my kids are like, well, why do we have to pay when they're not paying? And I was like, it's my expectations. And I hold you in a higher regard. I know you can afford this, and I expect you to pay. Um, I don't think we, yeah, we can't hold um, diplomas for that, but kids will come up with the money if you if you say, this is what you need to do before you're able to play. Able to play. Thank you. Dr. LeCount, you have a question. The question is to Ms. Baronis. Thank you. In selecting a new superintendent, how will you ensure that the voices and concerns of the community are not only heard, but represented in such an important decision? And why has it the district moved quickly to expedite the successor of Dr. Walters? I'll answer the first question first. Um, I was at the last board meeting, and I know that they are moving forward as to why they haven't expedited it, I don't know what the timeline is, so I can't answer that question, you know, um, informed. Um, How will you ensure that the voices and concerns of the community are heard when selected? Um, that's, that's a 
difficult question to answer because we've just discussed how it's difficult to get input. Um, I know that a lot of schools use like um, a survey monkey type of thing to send out, um, maybe holding an open meeting or you know, with the board and having you know concerned citizens. Don't give them like 20 minutes to talk. Of course, you know, just maybe drop what a concern is that maybe they think should, uh, a superintendent should instill. So just, again, communicating with, with, with them and opening it up to know, hey, if you have a question, shoot your, your student's teacher an email or shoot your counselor an email. Just you know, kind of maybe putting your input in, um, making them feel welcome and important in the decision of the most important position of the school district. Thank you, Mr. Bowen. One of the things that we've decided to do is hire a, uh, uh, I'm calling them recruiters, I don't know that that's a fair term, but a, a, an organization who will assist us in finding a viable candidate for that position. When we request that, whatever, when we request the proposals from the various groups that do that professionally, one of the questions will be, what will you do to assure that the community is involved in this process? Some groups do focus groups, some groups do town halls, some groups, but that will be a criteria as far as I'm concerned in assuring not only the community, but the teachers and the administrators and students also all have a, a chance to say, this is what we want. And then, again, some, some organizations and after we narrow it down to one two or three candidates will allow some members of the community and some members of the teaching staff and some administrators to be involved in those interviews and have input to the board the board retains the obligation to hire the right person but i would seek as much transparency and open openness as we can do to have the community involved maybe that will increase investment in thank you mr president Ms. Johnson. I agree that we need more than just a few people involved in this. Um, we do have a, a survey um, that the district has purchased that we could use that for. They haven't used it much since we purchased it. We've had it one or two times. That would be a good time to bring it out again. Um, and this would might be a, a, a good way to get the um, get the community involved. Um, we've tried, we, we wanted to start this probably about three months ago, four months ago, and it, it, we've kept stalling on it. Um, we're getting to the point where we really do need to start, it, it need, it's, it's getting to, it's serious time now. We need, to, we need to present this, we need to get this uh, the group that we're gonna have. The recruiters, they need to start working on people and working in how do they do their job to get candidates for this and we we need to um, hear everybody we have the community the teachers um, all, all all aspects of our district not just the teachers but the parapros the, the janitors the cooks those those people need to be involved with this too because they are all under the superintendent and they have to know that their voices are heard so as soon as we can get this started it will make our make the job a lot easier Thank you. This is Wells. This will be my third superintendent hire. The process is normally the board has to have a conversation about what it is that they want in a superintendent and in a search firm. We just began that conversation at our last board meeting. Um, we will need to have a subsequent conversation to review the draft of the RFP letter that we will send out to the search firms. Once we have selected a search firm and given them the instructions that they need to look for the candidate that we think will best suit our community, we will have that search, that search firm will give us in their RFP what steps they are going to take to uh, engage the community and they will engage the community at the level that the board asked them to engage. The last time that we did a superintendent search, um, 
we did have town hall forums and we allowed those people to be met by the community. We also brought them in to all of the buildings and let them tour the district. And then they met with uh, central office staff and they met with uh, building staff at the, at the various buildings. This will be a, an intensive search and this is one place where the board has to be united in what they are looking for. When we talked about um, getting ready to do our RFP letter, one of the things that really gave me uh, a lift to my heart was the fact that each board member when they spoke talked about the importance of maintaining competency-based education and perfecting it. So that shows that we are united in the direction that we want to go. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Um, Ms. Markham, you have the question, and the question is to uh, Ms. Johnston. The, the district has struggled with a high turnover rate of teachers and administrators. What should be done to bring qualified people to Kankakee and to keep them here? Everyone knows that there is a teacher, teacher shortage. However, if we do what we need to do to keep our teachers in our buildings, we wouldn't have a shortage. Um, I know, I, and I've watched as not, they're not retiring, they're leaving, they're resigning. And these are friends of mine that I taught with for years. And the, everything they've told me is, it's not the kids, it's not, it's, it's not even the administrators in the buildings. It's, the, it's all of the different things that they're trying to change. They change things daily. And it, and it got to the point, and it's not that they don't want to do it, they do. It's just that the constant different changes daily that, that, they've, that they've been asked to do. They love the kids, and they hate leaving because they, they, they don't want to leave those kids. We need to make it so they want to stay here. They, they, the, the, the administrators, uh, building-wise, central office, need to communicate with the teachers. They need to know who their teachers are. They need to know what makes them tick and why are they here, and we need to keep that happening with them. I, I hate Thank it you, Ms. to see these leaders. Ms. Ms. Uh, Mrs. Wells. I agree with Ms. Johnson that there has been a critical teacher shortage. One of my favorite new hobbies is to watch teacher TikTok. If you really want to know what teachers are thinking, watch them on TikTok, they'll tell you. So teaching has been has become an overburdened field. Everything that can't get done in other spaces gets handed to the teacher. Then we have to increase the classroom size because we had to cut the budget. That was back in 2008. And we still haven't reduced those classroom sizes at the elementary levels. We know as a country what it takes to make education better. But the problem is we think that it is not of enough value to invest in education the way it needs to be invested. Starting salaries for teachers are too low. The governor is looking at adding money to that, but he won't guarantee that we will have that money 10, 15 years down the road. Thank so you, Ms. it's Thank really you, Ms. up Williams. to the voters to tell the government that they need to invest in education. Thank you, Ms. Barones. We need to take care of our teachers. They are, again, as I said before, they are out there every day with those children. Teachers don't see their students as students. Teachers see a real teacher, a good teacher, will see their students as their children. And they will care for those children. 
So as administrators, you need to listen and we need to find out what our teachers need to make their children better students, to help their children succeed, listening to them. And yes, there is a huge teacher shortage. And how do we take care of that, like Ms. Wells said? You know, we have to go to the top and see if we can you know, talk to your legislation and, and our government to raise the, you know, the salaries for teachers so that they feel appreciated, that they feel that what they're doing for their students isn't overshadowed by throwing more work at them and expecting them to meet all of these high, all these standards, but yet you're giving them more and not giving them more tools. Thank you, Ms. Morales. Mr. Bowling. There are two specific things that can be done to improve teacher retention. One is we Mr. Bowling, can you talk into the mic? Sorry. Thank you. One is that we three years ago started, or five years ago, excuse me, started the process of doing exit interviews. Why are people leaving? What's the issue? What and for many of it it's a personal issue, some of it is a systemic issue, some of it but it, you can see a trend by doing exit interviews. Those continue and they're still in place, but nobody, we're, we're seeing no exit interviews anymore because nobody's trying to push teachers to give us their input on the way out the door. That's one thing. Second thing we can do is we can stop publicly blaming teachers for everything bad that happens in the district. And we do that. And we do that from the administration standpoint, we do it from the board standpoint, and at some point you get tired of being beat up if you're a teacher. Right. So instead of blaming them for everything, we ought, I, you know, one of the things I ask, have asked, and I still think it's a good idea, you know, sometimes you think your own ideas are really good, but <laughs> I had asked to say, we celebrate when a kid signs the letter of intent to go to, on an athletic scholarship. Why don't we celebrate for every kid that gets accepted to college? Why don't we celebrate when every, every kid that gets sworn in in the military? Let's acknowledge these accomplishments and then let's have a teacher, instead of the coach, have a teacher standing beside that kid as we celebrate that event. Thank you, Mr. Bowman. Mrs. Uh, Clayton, you have the question. The question is to Mrs. Wells. Um, so, so since we talked about uh, retaining teacher morale, what um, criteria do you look for when evaluating the superintendent? So what is the criteria I look for when evaluating the superintendent? That's the question. Um, that superintendent, one, needs to understand our district. We have a complicated past. We have a complicated present, and we'll probably have a complicated future. They need to be passionate and dedicated toward education. They need to put students first. Um, and they need to understand all of the moving parts. It's like a Rube Goldberg machine when you look at all of the different things that this district does. And I agree with uh, Board Member Bowlin, I'm sorry, Mr. Bowlin, when he says <laughs> that we should celebrate our successes. We need to find a way to amplify that. Um, we do do awards night, and that does celebrate it, but it's not as robust as the sports, because Sports are, it, it reminds me of the Roman uh, amphitheater and Caesar said, give them bread and give them the gladiators. But going back to the superintendent, they have to be able to juggle all of these balls and keep them in the air and not drop one. Thank you, Ms. Warren. In other words, Ms. do the impossible. I agree with Ms. Wells, definitely know the district. 
uh, each district is different just because they were a prior superintendent doesn't mean that they have the exact qualifications to be a superintendent in our district. As stated before, our, our district is struggling. You know, there's a lot of work that this our new superintendent is going to have to face, and they need to be able to be prepared and be able to do it with grace, dignity, respect, um, and the willingness to, again, as I said before, communicate. Communicate is, communication is very, very important. And this new superintendent needs to be familiar with CBD. I don't think a uh, superintendent, me personally, I don't feel a superintendent that is not familiar with CBE should be in our district because their job is to teach us, the community, the teachers, the students what CBE is. So how are we going to have a superintendent that's not familiar with CBE when we have to teach them? Thank you, Mr. Bowling. There's currently a process for evaluating the superintendent. And when we sign a contract with the superintendent, we put goals in that contract. The problem is it's a multi-year contract, and the goals really need to be revised on an annual basis. Because otherwise, you can't look at what happened three years ago and say those goals are the same ones that should cause the evaluation today. So in terms of evaluating the superintendent, I think we set goals, specific goals on an annual basis and include that as part of our, when we talk about a contract, and then apply those goals uh, in terms of, eva of an, eva an annual evaluation as to whether those goals were met or not. But they need to be somewhat specific because there are specific problems each year that, that arise that only the superintendent can solve. This is Joe. This is Jones. Your question was about evaluating the new incoming superintendent or evaluating the past superintendent? Evaluating the superintendent. superintendent. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I know. Um, I think first and foremost, um, they have to know the community. They can't just come in here from anywhere and expect to know what's going on. They have to know the community. That doesn't mean they have to have lived here. It doesn't have to, does, that doesn't, that's not what that means, but they have to be familiar with the community. Um, I would like to see a superintendent that used to be in a classroom, that taught, that was also a, a, an administrator in a, class, in, a, in a school, whether it's elementary or uh, secondary. I also would like to see the superintendent be, have experience as a superintendent. Um, it doesn't have to be uh, a, a school district specifically like ours because that's sometimes those are hard to find but they need to have run a school district they can't just come in without any without any background of being a superintendent and how to run the school district they need to have done this before they need experience um, and we need to be very diligent when we're when we're looking into that we can't just say oh well this person knows that the district did but they've never had it they've never been a superintendent well, let's let's go ahead and do that we have got to, we've got to reach out to other people and, and what their thoughts are, and we've got to take that into consideration, but we definitely need someone with experience. Thank you. Mr. Clark, you have a question and questions to Mr. Rose. There has currently been a lot of upgrades to the high school. What will be done to make sure that that, that the upgrades are not just for one specific building, but for all the buildings within the district. Being new to the board, I unfortunately cannot give a well-informed decision. I think I would have to speak with other board members as to how things have been done in the past um, to see what we can do to move forward and ensure that those things happen with the other buildings and looking at the budget as well. We have an ongoing maintenance program that requires, uh, that doesn't require, that sets our goals for what we need to do to each of the buildings. That's the stand, that we use the architects to help us with that ongoing maintenance program. There will be no substantial new projects in the district because we don't, we just spent that money. So that's not gonna happen. 
and in fact, this year we were limited to $50,000 maintenance projects, a $50,000 maintenance project, again, because of the commitment to build the field house. But ongoing, there is a plan on how we maintain and improve buildings from the standpoint of air conditioning. Whenever we, mod in, whenever we modify a building, it has to be air conditioned. Um, and ultimately, my goal is that they're all air conditioned so they can be used year round if that becomes the priority of the board. Uh, but there will not be upgrades like there was to the high school. The high school is literally the flagship. And with our current financial situation and the commitment we, that was, the board made to the field house, there's not going to be any of that for some time to come. Ms. Jones. I do know that there are there's be there's uh, renovations to the roofs uh, to the, the HVAC systems, and yes, we're trying to make sure that if it's not an air conditioning, it is a I don't know the terminology, but it's it's a it's an air thing that's the, the airflow um, brings in better air than the hot that the heat outside. Um, I don't know the typical the, the real specific word for that, but. I know that's being used. Um, it was done at, at Kennedy. I think it was done at King. Um, we did make uh, extensive renovations also at the junior high, uh, where we've re renovated not the whole building, but a lot of the building, the, the building, the part that people, most people see when you come in. Um, but yes, the, the, the high school is beautiful. Uh, it's built with um, pods where uh, different, there's like a pod and there's like seven or eight classrooms off of that pod and in, in theory it's a great idea but one of the problems is we didn't allow for as many students as we have and so now we have a beautiful building that we don't have enough room for the kids um, that's a concern but uh, there's no way to, there's no way to fix that thank you mrs. Wills would you repeat the question please what it, there have been a lot of renovations to the high school and a lot of money committed to the high school and renovations what is being done to make sure that that is spread out throughout the course of the district that buildings are all behind uh, outside of the high school okay um well the theory when we renovated the high school is that that is the goal for every student who steps across a Kankakee School District threshold to become a Kankakee High School graduate. And we really felt that it needed to be upgraded and brought into the 21st century. So that was a goal that we've achieved. Um, we have, as um, Mr. Bolin spoke about, a uh, ongoing plan for renovation and money that we allocated uh, for over this summer to do some renovations across the district. Uh, we have, um, we are managing our bond letting so that as uh, we spend the money, we, we are able, as we pay it back, to relet bonds and, and have that money in place in our funds to continue to be upgrading buildings and to continue with the maintenance of the building. So it is, we have a uh, finance and facility, uh, I'm gonna call it a group, and I'm sorry, it's not a group, committee, <laughs> um, that meets every month, all year long. Very rarely Thank you, Mrs. not Moore. have a finance and facility. Dr. LeCun, you, you have the next question, the question is uh, to Mr. Bowler. Thank you. This question is twofold. How should procurements reflect full transparency when seeking bidders for capital improvements that we just discussed? Should there always be more than one bid on the table? Why or why not? And lastly, what will you do as a school board member to require businesses of color uh, at the table that they receive contracts for service and industry, school district 111? In response to the first part of the question, absolutely they should be transparent. 
should, to the extent possible, I believe we should bid projects, and that we do. Where we don't typically bid is in technology, which the law doesn't require, but again, I think the more quotes you get, the better off we are in terms of cost. So those two issues are there. Now, in terms of set-asides, which is what I would call assuring that minority contractors are at the table, the bidding process is advertised uh, substantially. We also encourage uh, that. We don't have a set-aside program at this point. Uh, it's something that I think can be and should be discussed. But at this point, we, we uh, attempt to get the best bid that we can get by the public bidding process. Uh, in terms of the additional, uh, I just lost my train of thought. You're, you had another part of that question. The third part, what will you do as a school board member to require our businesses of um, color to be? I think present? going forward, they set aside maybe a, maybe a, they get appropriate res response to that, but we don't have it at this point. Ms. Jones. At one point in time, I thought that we were trying to get most of our bids from this area, um, but we lost track of that somehow. Um, I, I guess the companies in this area maybe weren't bidding low enough. Uh, the, the bigger companies up north, um, they've come in with the bids uh, from Chicago and even up farther north than that especially with all of the construction that we had. Um, I don't think we have anything in place except for the fact that we do, you know, that the bids go out, they, we explain to them what we need and what, what is going to be, what entails with whatever we're doing, and then we just have to hope that um, uh, companies of color will respond to us. I, I don't know if we specifically go out and focus on that. I, I don't even know if that's if any school district can do that. Um, it would be something that we should look into though. I, I definitely think we should do that. Um, especially if they're local. Local would be awesome if we can keep if we can keep our business here in town. Because we spend an awful lot of money and if we can keep it in this area, that would be a that would be a plus. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Mrs. Wills. Okay, so uh, I moved that we have a second part first. Um, because we had large construction projects, I don't, I didn't know, I don't know personally of any firms in this area that are owned by people of color that would be able to take on that project. But I have, however, seen local businesses of color work as subcontractors, um, doing the cement work, doing the asphalt work. So, there have been uh, contractors of colors that have gotten some of the um, spending that the district has done. Uh, for wise as bidders, as Mr. Boland and Ms. Johnson both intimated, it is done through the normal process where we advertise it and then the bids are opened at the same time. So. Um, and locally, we have had bids locally, but they have not been as competitive as some of the bids from out of town, unfortunately. Thank you. Ms. Baronis. The bidding process is something also that is new to me. I'm just getting familiar with it with working at Karma, so I'm not real familiar with the business, with, with the bidding process. I do know that you, know, you have to put out what you're, as, uh, Ms. Johnston said, what you're looking for, and then you get your information back. Um, as for keeping businesses local, uh, I agree, we need to keep our businesses local, but as Ms. Well said, it's unfortunate sometimes because they are competing against those big companies, you know, who are able to give a, a lower bid because they have more of the manpower, more of the, the, the equipment that they need. So that's unfortunate. So how do we fix that? I don't know the answer to that, but that is definitely something that I could work on 
and you know see as a board what we can do. Thank you. Because Mark, you have the next question and the question is to uh, Ms. Jones. Um, Th Thomas Edison Primary recently made a list where not a single student tested on the Illinois Assessment of Readiness in 2022 could read at grade level. Um, what are your concerns with this outcome? What, is that, what does that mean to you? I know that the principal at Thomas Edison is doing a great job. He's one of our better principals, younger principals. He also, the, that's a, the, the, the testing was for the third graders, and those third graders are from a lot of different schools. They, didn't, they, they weren't K through two at Edison, and then just showed up, and then now they're being tested. They've, been, they've, they've come from other schools. So it's kind of misleading that Thomas Edison you know, is not testing well. And, I really find it hard that not one third grader can read third grade level. I just, I find that really hard. Um, I don't know if it's they're not testing properly, if, I mean, if they're, they're not ready for it. I do know that they are taking an awful lot of steps to prepare these kids for the, the, the tests coming up. Um, they're doing practice tests. The, the, the teachers are all on board. Um, they know the importance of this. And it's a great staff over there. I mean, it's, it's not, you can't put your finger on one problem with, with what's going on, um, but it takes you know it takes a community, it takes a you know the community of the school of, of Stupid or I'm sorry Edison to get these kids up to up to speed. And again, if we Thank can you, get Johnson. them to read, Mrs. Wills. I want to finish. Finish. Okay. <laughs> All right. No, no, that's good. I think they're better. Okay. Um, do people realize that reading is actually not a natural state for the human brain that this is actually something that mankind invented because they had too much information to remember i just saw that i was watching uh, a channel 11 program so i was like okay so we perhaps need to take a new approach to reading. I, I remember Erica Garza that used to have the Thomas Edison building. Um, no, she had Mark Twain. But she used to bring in a dog and let the kids read to a dog. And that showed that the kids would relax, it would lower their tension levels, and they could concentrate on reading as opposed to being worried about missing words. I don't know about you, but I remember when I was taught to read, they would have reading hour and you all would go, they would go through the classroom and call on you and it would be your turn to stand next to your desk and read. And if you missed the word, the whole class was laughing at you. So, we have a junior high school that's well. right next door. Perhaps we can well. bring those older kids and those younger kids together and they can support each other. Stop, Ms. Ms. Baronis. I personally am not a fan of standardized testing. Not all students test well. I mean, I was one of those students, you put a test in front of me and just everything flew out of my brain. And it's just the nervousness. Um, so we need to, you know, what's gonna make our students more comfortable in standardized testing? Because unfortunately, it's the world we live in. Um, so I don't, again, I don't like that that's how we, assess our kids is by sitting them down and having them you know, do, do circles. So I think in a way, um, I, I, again, I didn't know uh, the numbers there. Um, but as Ms. Johnston said, I don't think it's a representation of our, of our administration or teachers or students. I think it's just a representation of how do we make this easier for our kids and you know, get them prepared for standardized testing. Mr. Bowman. The results at Edison are very frustrating because I have participated in Edison for all the years I've been on the board. And I know the changes and the efforts that have been made. One of the critical ones that have been made is, and I never remember the acronym, but it's, instead of an individual student-teacher conference, they have all of the parents come to the 
come to the conference and you're given a file showing where your student is in relation not just to the state, but in relation to other students within, the, within the, that classroom and within the other students in Edison. And then they enter into a contract with parents saying this is what we think you need to do and they, parents, I believe, bought into it and did it. Uh, we had 80 some percent of the, well actually it's higher than that, but the first one they had about 60 percent of the parents show. By the end of the year they had over 80 percent of the parents participating in that. That was the best example of parent engagement, but what's been the result? We haven't seen it in test results. So what is happening there now is going to be, they're going to intensify working on tests and tests to accommodate test results. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Bowman. Uh, we're uh, entering and closing statements. Again, I'd like to thank each one of you who participated tonight. I'd like to thank our panelists and our executive committee and those individuals uh, in the audience. I close in statements two minutes in this order with Ms. Johnson, followed by Mrs. Wells, Mr. Bowman, Ms. Baronis. Two minutes. Thank you. First, I'd like to thank the um, NAACP for hosting this. Um, four years ago when I did this, I told, I think I made the comment that I'm totally out of my comfort zone, even though I stood up in front of a class and, and students for four years. <clears throat> this is totally different. Um, but I appreciate that you do this because it does help. Um, I want to thank the, the library for hosting this. Um, it just makes their days a little bit longer. Um, as I said, this is a very important board. This is the, the election coming up is so important because we are going to be the ones that choose the next leader of our district, and that is so important. Um, that person's going to need to have a strong commitment to our district, and we're going to need to have a strong, strong commit, commitment to them. Um, we need to be able to communicate with not only each other, and the administration, but also the teachers and the students. Um, I've been accused for only caring about the teachers um, because I was a teacher for so long, but the teachers are the ones that are teaching the students, and they are, in essence, the next leaders of our, of our community, and we want them to come back. And we would like them to come back if they have a great relationship with their teachers to come back and teach. Um, that's why I ended up teaching, because I had a great communication with my teachers. Um, but as a board, we need to try to get those teachers here. We also need to eliminate as many as possible the instructors that are there taking the spots of teachers that we don't have. We need to, we need to eliminate that. We have too many instructors um, filling in the spots, and we need, and we, that needs to be eliminated. Mrs. Wells. I want to also offer my thanks to the NAACP and the library. This is an important opportunity for the community to hear from the candidates who are asking to choose your next superintendent of schools. Um, I just want to say this is the culmination of many years of work for me. A superintendent choice can either make or break a district. We have had a serious problem with retention for our wives as administrators, and that is because our economy is actually doing quite well. And education is not the uh, stellar career that it once was. So there is that competition that we are up against. So we need people who are committed to children and committed to serving so that we can secure our future as a country, as a city, and as a state. I believe that I have experience that is valuable from having done this work for a long time. I am very passionate about the work that I do. I believe that our children can be served better 
by continuing the course that we have set upon. No, it has not been easy. Yes, there have been problems along the way. But we descend from people who set upon this land called Kankakee and changed a wild <laughs> land into a city. And we can take this district and take all of our imperfections and continue to perfect them. Thank you. Mr. Bowling? Once again, thank you to the NAACP. Thank you to the panelists. That's not a, a much fun job, I know, but I really it's important and I appreciate it. And thanks to the survivors in the audience. You know, this is, <laughs> we appreciate you guys sticking around. It would be hard to just talk to the chairs. It's, it's very helpful. And I want to thank the other three sitting up here. You know, school boards, and I've had people ask me because I obviously am a senior member of the board, why the hell are you doing this? And the answer is because I believe in what we are to do as a board of education. We are to make our community better by improving the knowledge and the competency and the ability of the young people who grow up in our, in our town. And I believe that the school district, when people talk about moving into a community, the first question they always bring is, what are your schools like? Every time. That's the number one question. And if we fail in doing what we're setting out to do, then our community will fail. I've invested a lot of time in this, in this community. I believe in it, I love it, but most important, I want to continue to invest time in our students. That's the reason I'm here. And we all say it, but I have no other agenda. I have a granddaughter in the district, but she's going to do way better than I ever did, so I'm not going to worry about her. <laughs> but I'm worried about the rest of the community because I want us to have scores that aren't embarrassments. I want us to have students that want to learn. Based upon that, I'm asking to return to the board. Um, I will still be a pain in the neck to some people. I, I, that's who I am. But I, at the same time, think that I can offer more in the next four years, and choosing a superintendent is the most important thing we can do. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Ms. Barones. I would like to again thank the NAACP, the KQQ Public Library, and the panelists um, for hosting this forum tonight. Um, KQQ District 111's mission statement is one community, one district, one vision for all children. As a school board, we should be able to encompass, enforce, and demonstrate every aspect of that mission statement. One community. I will work with my fellow board members to bring a level of comfort to families, students, and taxpayers so that they feel safe and welcome to District 111. One district. I will work, I will work on building a school board that works together and respectfully to be a positive example of leadership to our community and our students. I will work together with my fellow board members to bring teamwork and togetherness amongst families, students, teachers, support staff, and administration. Work together as one unit will give our students a strong foundation to reach and attain any goals they may have. One vision, I will work to bring unity among families, students, teachers, support staff, and administration to put and have the needs of our students first. For all children, every student, no matter the student's background, language, race, economic profile, gender, learning capability, disability or family history. Each student has the opportunity to get the support and resources they need to achieve their educational goals. One of Mexico's famous artists, Frida Kahlo, said, Pies, para que los necesito si tengo alas para volar? Feet, what do I need you for if I have wings to fly? Mm -hmm. Our students have their feet. Let's work together to give them their wings to fly. Thank you. Thank you again to the candidates, to the panelists, 
I wish to thank you all for demonstrating your civic concerns by attending this event. Don't forget to vote on Tuesday, April 4th. Thank you, and let's have a great evening. Thank you.